This morning we're going to have a presentation from Jeff Hollenbaugh, Dye Management, about Project 1304, which was just published. Again, thank you all. We'll just uh, jump right in. Uh, the 1304 project was for optimal replacement cycles of highway maintenance equipment. Uh, had several primary objectives, but essentially wanted to develop a systematic approach for making equipment replacement decisions. Uh, a lot of folks are doing it a lot of different ways, so we, we worked with quite a few of you uh, with your respective agencies to identify those processes, literature review, and, and identify some of these best practices. I, I know I'm kind of talking to a captured audience here, but I want to speak to some of the benefits of effective fleet replacement. Obviously, the operational efficiencies, reduced life cycle costs is the goal, but also there's some of those non-pecuniary, to use an SAT word, benefits to it. Employee morale, some of the public perception of just essentially good-looking equipment and then just being good stewards with, with uh, taxpayer dollars. Several outputs from the project. Uh, I'm going to talk probably most specifically about uh, the guide and, and then spend a fair amount of time uh, showing some of the outputs, well, inputs and outputs from the tool. But it did include a user manual. So for those folks who are looking to implement, it's a detailed user manual on just how you can go about implementing the tool at your agency. The guide is sort of a primer, talks about some of the concepts of fleet replacement, life cycle cost analysis, and gives you some help in, in updating your program to align with some of those best practices. And as John mentioned, there are a few copies of the final research report, uh, hard copies up here. I've got a link at the end of the presentation that you can also get it online as well. I'm sure this slide looks pretty familiar to most of you, but essentially the goal, we want to we wanna hit that sweet spot in terms of, of replacement planning. The, these costs here are, are smoothed out. We know that those obviously aren't year-to-year -year a smooth curve in terms of maintenance costs, but these are stylized graphs to, to represent that. But the, the sweet spot there in the middle is where we're looking to replace that equipment, and it, it often represents a window of time, not necessarily a specific point. But that's essentially what that graph is showing you there. The tool uses uh, these replacement factors. I'm not going to read them all to you here. I'm sure a lot of those are pretty straightforward, but I am going to focus on a few of these, talk a little bit more specifically. But when I go uh, into the tool demonstration, you'll see You'll see uh, a little bit more on these, but I am going to, I'm not sure if you can see out there, but uh, depreciation, downtime, condition and mission criticality, and overhead are highlighted. Those are some of the less maybe obvious ones that, that folks might uh, not necessarily consider at times. In this tool, the depreciation is not your typical accounting uh, depreciation. It's not straight line or, or double declining depreciation. This is actually based on salvage values. And the example that we use with that is the accounting world if you had uh, two vehicles that are eight years old, oftentimes those are viewed worth the same as far as uh, in terms of depreciation. But uh, as you all know, in your salvage, or excuse me, your equipment auctions, that's not necessarily the case. So we looked at factoring in the actual utilization of that. So if you have those two vehicles that are eight years old, one has 100,000 miles and one has 150,000 miles, obviously uh, th those do have different values in terms of the resale. So, we worked with several agencies, I, I don't recall all, the, the, all of those offhand, but to get those average salvage values and set up some depreciation tables, which I'll show here in another slide. Here's the depreciation schedule for uh, half-ton pickups. And, and again, as you can see, uh, as the vehicle ages, we, we've got those different schedules, but those are based off of uh, the, the agency data. This is a factor uh, within the tool that you all are able to customize, and, and that'll make more sense, or well, hopefully it'll make more sense when I show the the demonstration, but it does have these default values built in, but this is one of the things that we would recommend an agency uh, tailors to their own experience in terms of their salvage values from equipment. This is just, again, another example of how you will see that the ownership cost for the life cycle, uh, or excuse me, for the depreciation accounted for in the tool. If you go to half ton pickup with 45,500 miles, uh, replacement cost of 25,000, using this depreciation schedule here, we show its current value is $10,875. Spreading that out over the life, or excuse me, the utilization life to date, uh, 24 cents per mile is a life, uh, life to date cost per mile. And that's again, that's, that's built within the tool. We would, we would strongly recommend that you all review those, your own agency data, and, and work to update those. Downtime is another important component within the tool, something that based on our research and discussions with, with a lot of you folks, if it is captured, it might not be wholly captured, uh, but but it, again, it's a it, it's an important consideration when you're when you're looking at the uh, replacement planning for it. 
the tool does, or excuse me, the guide does have uh, some guidance in terms of calculating that downtime, but essentially it's any time that that equipment's not available for service. It's, it's not necessarily a, a monetary outlay, it, it does have an impact. This is another one that we chose to incorporate into the tool based on, uh, on conversations. This sort of aligns more with the performance-based uh, approach to managing assets. Uh, it, it's not just that point in time. Uh, we'd like to add this factor in here for you so that you can bring in the condition of that piece of equipment uh, when you're making your replacement de decisions. And we've got a few slides on, on that condition assessment form that was developed as part of this project. Uh, as part of the tool demonstration. Now, again, this does not impact the optimal replacement cycle, but what it does is give you another uh, input into that decision-making process when it comes time to uh, decide between unit A or unit B. Overhead rates, again, based on our discussions with you folks, it sounds like oftentimes the overhead rates might not be fully accounted, or the mechanic overhead rates aren't fully accounted for uh, in, the, in those rates. I, I'll use an example from an agency that recently completed their own audit, so to speak, of those accounting rates, and I believe they were charging uh, $35 an hour for their mechanics, and after an internal review, it looked more like $53. And, and that agency shall, rename, shall remain nameless, but it uh, is one that the principal investigator on this project uh, works with in, in, uh, in his additional time. The replacement decision is a process. Again, it's not just simply push the button and fit out your answer and then, and, and then you go ahead and work through your replacement planning. It, it is a process that must be worked through. And, and one of the things we also want to note in this, due to the importance of, of the fleet in terms of maintenance operations and the agency overall, we highly recommend dedicated resources to this process. It, it's, you all have, have your jobs that you go through day to day and a lot of this um, can require some additional effort. So hopefully, if you folks are able to implement this tool, you're able to demonstrate the importance of having those resources, that, again, that you can devote to this to ensure that you're getting, the, so that it's most effective. One of the important features in the, or one of the factors in this is the data cleanup. Uh, I'm sure you folks have varying levels of completeness and accuracy in, in your data. When we were looking at the agency data that we gathered to incorporate into the tool, some, some common things that we found were in-service years of 1900, utilization of, of equipment that there's not that many hours in a year, th those types of things, those outliers. So uh, ho hopefully you hope folks have some systems or processes in place that you can catch those ahead of time, but the data cleanup uh, is an important factor. And I, I, again, we can, we can speak to some of that specifically, but I'm sure uh, you folks have some of those examples as well in your, in your own agency data there. But again, the organizational considerations. Uh, it, it will take some time and resources to this. Tim, Tim spoke last week at the Committee on Maintenance about his experience with the tool and some of the, the iterations he had to go through in order to get the, the results to be reasonable for him. And, and, and again, that's just something that folks, folks will need to work through. And so hopefully you're able to raise the fleet and equipment program up to the level of some of these uh, maybe more more robust programs, pavement and bridge, some of those they get the, the main focus, but uh, without, without the fleet and equipment to support those efforts, it's, uh, it'll, it'll be a struggle to have an effective bridge and pavement program as well. I mentioned the tool, uh, six main functions. I won't read these off to you here. We will go into those a little bit more when I get into the demonstration. It, it does have these, these six functions built into it, uh, and again, this is part of that replacement process. One of the things that we found initially, which has been a bug that was fixed, when folks were downloading the tool to their system, they weren't saving it on the C drive. It is, it, it is necessary to get it saved on the C drive and for those links to work. We've got a splash screen built into the system now, so when you, there's a link online to download the tool. When you click that link for the tool, it'll, it'll send one of those pop-ups for, do you want to make this change to your computer? So hopefully it'll save it in the right place for you to avoid, to avoid that issue. But that was a common thing that we found early on in the program. But uh, a, a bug that's since been fixed. But this is what it'll look like on your C drive. Demo values here, any, anything with white cells in the configuration file are fields that are editable and, and should be edited. EMTSB 2018 annual meeting queued in here, a planning year of 2018, and, and all of these other white fields are editable that we recommend you folks uh, take a look at and update annually as part of your process. But I, I will note, th these are again default values that come in here. That downtime rate is essentially your equipment rental rate uh, or equal to your rental rate. These targets are, are, are again just based off of uh, an aggregation of the agency data that we found. We recommend after a few cycles 
of this, you, you might want to look at this and, and update your, your planning targets based on the results of the life cycle analysis tool. Again, those are, those are all those fields that will need to be configured uh, in the initial setup of the tool. And speaking of locked, I should mention anything that's in the blue cell is a, a field that's, that's not editable. Some additional fields in the configuration file. I, I mentioned overhead, definitely something we would recommend that you folks perform. If, if you're comfortable with your overhead rates, th then fine, but it is something that we noticed, again, that might be understated overall. But direct and uh, indirect overhead, as I mentioned, these default values come in there, but, but would take a look at those. Inflation's built in. We have obsolescence, which in this case is, is built off of a, an estimated 2% reduction in fuel efficiency. It, it's, again, a factor that we wanted to include in there, but that's something that you all, that, that you all can take a look at and, and see if it's appropriate for your agency. There's a data entry uh, sheet as part of the tool. This is, this is what it looks like. I've got some default data built in here. It is very important that your data matches these fields exactly, or I, I should say that the correct fields are, are filled with the correct data because otherwise, again, you'll get some, if, if it will work at all, you'll get a lot of NAs, a lot of reference errors, those types of things. But the data from your system, whether that's uh, you know, an off-the-shelf or in-house equipment management system, but it needs to be in this format in order for the tool to, to function. Some folks, one of the potential enhancements would be automatically linking this data into the tool. It's not part of this project, but that would be a recommended enhancement for anybody that was looking to implement to hopefully avoid some of these data entry errors. So for this, uh, I, I've just got screenshots of the tool. I don't have it actually um, to where I could do it dynamically, but I've run, uh, again, using just some, some test data from an agency that was provided as part of the tool, I've run uh, an analysis for sedans. I, I showed a screenshot there, a little bit of that, but it's, it's that from that data set um, using the planning year uh, 2018, the current replacement value on these sedans is 18,000. That's important. I want to I want to show um, some of the you know sensitivity to the replacement cost, and I'll, I'll show that here in a little bit. But the replacement candidates are identified based off of those items that are either 25% greater than the average cost life to date for that class, um, or have exceeded the uh, replacement targets that you see in. So anything that you see with an X in the tool exceeds that replacement target of, of its utilization. Anything that you see here without the X is represented because it's, uh, its life-to-date costs are greater than 25% of that average. So this is just the list based off of that. Next form will show you, or excuse me, the condition assessment form comes in next, and, and then you'll see how that will reorder the priority ranking within there. Here's the screenshot of the condition assessment form. This is also something that's customizable to the agency. Um, it comes with different weights, as you can see here based on those categories that you're looking at, body, engine, that type of thing. You can weight those differently. Again, it's set up with default. We would recommend that you all take a look at that and update that as necessary. It currently is set to, you, you can uh, update those, those different weights. It will, we recommend that those weights total to 100, but, but truthfully, it, it allocates it within the tool. Um, it doesn't have to, but it, it makes more sense if those weights total 100, at least, at least to me it does. This is where we've entered the condition assessment scores for those, those various units that we had in there. This is how you'll be able to then prioritize. As you can see here, unit number 12128 is 594% over the class average. Uh, it hasn't exceeded its uh, life to date miles or uh, hours target, or in this case miles because of sedans, but it has not exceeded that planning target as yet, but it is 594% over the uh, class average. That's important when we, we get to some of the next slides. I've, I've inserted again just some, some mock condition assessment scores, and so we'll see what, what happens once we factor those in as well. Again, 12128 was the equipment number that was, was identified because it was the highest cost over the average. Once we factor in the, repl or, excuse me, the condition, you'll see 12168 has now become the first priority. It's got a, a lower condition score, and the default value for, uh, or the default values within the tool are 40% weighted for cost, 60% weighted for condition. Again, completely customizable. If you want to flip those, you can. I'll, I'll show what the impact of that is uh, on this slide here. So again, we had, what was it, 12128 <laughs> was the first. Once we factored in condition 12168, and then once we flipped the weighting factors to 60% cost, 40% condition, you'll see that we've got a new equipment unit 
12164 as the first priority for, for replacement. And, and again, you can, you can tailor those specifically based on agency preference. You're also able to conduct uh, life cycle analysis on a specific unit. Um, there is a limitation to this. You're only able to identify that optimal replacement after the fact, but it will give you a little bit more of trend information on specific units as you're making your decision. So again, here's just an example. What did we pick here? A sweeper, uh, an individual unit. You do need to have annual cost and utilization for each year of the equipment's life in order to conduct this. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, this is just one more tool that you can that you can bring into the replacement decision. But we've, we've set up these values of an hourly downtime rate of $80, uh, current replacement cost $184,000. So what this is gonna show us is that the uh, lowest life cycle cost of this particular unit within the sweeper class was year eight. And as you can see, it's, it's trending upward. So this is one that you would wanna take a look at um, as you were going through your replacement planning process, noting that this is trending up uh, you would want to keep an eye on this and, and factor that into the replacement decision. This can give you, an, you know, an estimate of future repair costs, just what it's going to cost going down the road. Once you've conducted your uh, class and unit level analysis, you're able to develop your replacement program. Uh, again, this is, this is a tool. Uh, you can use those priority rankings as the starting point and go from there. If sufficient funds were available, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't need this. You would utilize the tool. It would say, here's the equipment units we need to replace. Give us our money. But unfortunately, I don't, I don't know how many of you folks are, are in that boat. I doubt many. I hope, I hope some are, but I, I doubt many. So this is where that process comes in, the art blending, blending the science um, in terms of replacement. The tool also features a five-year replacement plan for each of those equipment classes. Uh, what this does, it quantifies the current backlog of, of each of those classes. So if I, if I take a look here, back to our sedan class, we've got, uh, using that $18,000 replacement cost, our current backlog, 1.8 million. You can see that there. It also quantifies the estimated replacement totals that you'll need for each of those classes over the next five years. Just based on the data that we have, what you'll see is in year 2022, it's estimating you'll need $158,949 for your sedan class. I think there's 152 units in this example data set that we have. And again, this is basically a planning tool uh, to communicate those needs to decision makers to, to forecast. Uh, I, I know with, with MAP21, a lot of times those five-year horizons and things like that and the other uh, asset classes that we have, but with equipment, we built this in so that you're again able to tell that story. And I will also just show quickly we had that $18,000 replacement cost in the backlog, just to demonstrate the tool functionality again. The backlog with 20,000 is over 2 million. So uh, just uh, to, to again show the, the impact of those replacement costs as you're setting it up, those are customizable. The cost consequences, again, one of the tools able to tell the story, uh, help support future budget requests. It essentially answers the question, what's it cost to keep these pieces of equipment beyond their economic life? Uh, using that sedan example, with the $18,000 replacement cycle, we found that, or excuse me, $18,000 replacement cost, the tool calculated an eight-year replacement cycle, optimal here. Total annual cost class of a uh, little over $500,000. If you move down to year 12, it's, it's about $508,000. So again, it's, it's demonstrating that impact of not being able to replace at the optimal time. Same, same with the $20,000 replacement cost here. 12-year cycle, that's the lowest point in the, in the uh, life cycle cost curve. You would see it trending back up. Uh, if, I, if I hadn't cut off <laughs> year 13, you would see it, the cost trending back up. So again, a tool to be able to tell that story and, and develop a business case for funding. I mentioned a couple of the uh, potential enhancements, but there are limitations to Excel. Uh, it's fine for uh, manipulating data, but Building it into more robust software would certainly be recommended. I know uh, some comprehensive, or excuse me, some commercial equipment management systems have functionality to build in models uh, into, into their specific software. So we would recommend uh, that as an enhancement. Uh, data validation feature within that data entry form is something, again, you can set up some ranges. So if you know that you're expecting to have 10,000 miles a year on your sedans, and somebody enters in 100,000 miles, it might not kick it out, but you could say, 
are you sure? And it's a way to, to speed up that data, data cleanup process. The downtime, I, as I mentioned, I, I know some folks uh, either struggle tracking it or aren't tracking it at all. Uh, but it is, it is a factor that, that should be considered in the replacement planning process. I know that's a simple begin tracking downtime, but um, it, it is something that we, that we recommend. A review of those mechanic overhead rates uh, to ensure that you're fully accounting for those when, when you're costing this out it is a recommendation as well. I discussed linking the condition assessment form into the tool. As it stands now, you complete the condition assessment form, you enter the results manually back into the tool. If you could link that, um, it, it would reduce some of those data entry errors or the possibility for data entry errors. I'll reiterate it again. Hopefully, we can, we can demonstrate the importance of effective fleet management programs through this tool, demonstrate that impact to the decision makers, hopefully uh, devote some more resources for you all as, as you're managing your program. It's, it seems to be one of those that gets cut quickest whenever budgets get tight. Um, they just say, well, you're not going to get new equipment, but that's, we know that that's false economy. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully some of these uh, programs and data-driven analysis tools will help support some of those requests for both budget and, and hopefully resources to, to manage the program. And then training for fleet managers on this, both on this and just the replacement planning process in general, is, is something that we, we hope would be uh, a, a result of this program in, in general. We've got the tool and report available online. I, I mentioned a couple a couple hard copies up here. I, I, I was traveling, so I didn't, I, I didn't bring 50 or 60 or whatever. I have five, and I'll, I'll claim it's because I wanted to be green, but it's really because I didn't feel like lugging that, that many around, around the country. But it is available. Uh, that link will take you to uh, the report and tool. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully you folks will take a look at it and, and see if it's something that you're able to, to develop within your agency. Lastly, just want to thank the project panel. Dr. Amir Hanna, the project manager um, for NGC the HRP on the project. I'd thank uh, Mr. Ron Hamilton, who was the principal investigator for dye management on the project. Ron was not able to be here. He is still very committed <laughs> to this project, but he's got fishing trips and grandkids that he, that he does a little bit more than have to crisscross like I do. So, And then thank you again to the technical services program for the opportunity to discuss this with you all. On the uh, clarification for installing the tool on the computer, my issue was that I, you know, I was trying to actually put it on the server. The way Excel works, it needs to be in the root, in the C drive. No folders, no nothing, it's just plain root C drive. Were you able to get any sort of, were you able to talk to your, I'll be honest, I'm not uh, terribly IT savvy as far as that goes. Were, it, it, was there any potential work around as far as being able to have it on your server? It, did, did not, it always gave me some okay. errors and things like that. It, well, and, and I know prior to having that splash screen that we had set up to where it automatically saved on the C drive, I, admittedly, um, I think two or three times when I was running tests on the tool, I, I had to remember I couldn't save it in a folder. As you mentioned, I had to have it directly on the C drive in its own folder. So it is, uh, again, a limitation. Hopefully that doesn't hang too many people up um, as far as having to have it on the server, but it was definitely something I was guilty of, and, and I think we mitigated some of that with the splash screen. Hi, hi, Jeff. Hi, Besides Excel, a more robust tool would, would be what? A access would, would, would help for sure, and, and something web-based, again, software. The, the reason it was Excel early on in the, the project, it, it's something everybody has. You don't have to go out and purchase. It, we wanted to make it accessible, but with, with that comes, comes limitations. Um, but but access would be one that, again, is also accessible to folks, but still not, not necessarily new off-the-shelf software. But uh, again, I know from, from other Excel tools we've developed, off-the-shelf management systems are able to, it, it, it takes resources, but are able to build the functionality within those tools. And th that would be something we'd recommend uh, if possible. So you're not transferring your equipment data from whatever system you're using into Excel or maybe access eventually, but, but that would be a recommendation for sure. I really just want to make a comment. Powerful tool, lots of, uh, lots of capability. I can imagine folks in the room feeling a little bit intimidated by some of the requirements of the tool with the uh, condition assessment and things. Um, just at least from my experience, if what you're looking for is recommendations or guidance on replacement criteria, uh, 
that requires a lot less effort. You know, you need to be able to clean data and 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 download it or, or input it, I guess, in the right format. But um, you know, the prioritization tool and some of the other things are secondary. They certainly uh, are a tool that might be helpful in your case. But if you're looking for guidance on replacement criteria, you don't have to go through the whole assessment process. You don't have to do a lot of the other things that are required to get that other piece. But, and you know, if you want to make a comment on that. Well, th that's correct. I, I, I should have emphasized that condition assessment is not required. The tool will run without it. it it's, it's something to help once you've identified those uh, replacement candidates, the, the condition assessments where you prioritize. But yes, that's correct, Tim, and I apologize. It's not required for the tool to run. It's just something that you can build in as a, an extra step to, to help prioritize once you've identified those candidates. With some of my, some of my fleet data, I have reliable fuel information and some I don't, depending on where they fuel. If fuel is excluded from the cost calculations, does that sway the output or does or is that not, and, and I guess I'm thinking about the replacement cycle sweet spot sort of calculation. It, it's not required. It was initially, um, and then after some feedback with, with some agencies, it was a similar response. It, it's not, fuel is also not required, but uh, it, it will I impact the analysis, but it is not a required field. Do you think, it's, will, do you think it will shift that sweet spot left or right? Yeah. If I remember correctly, when we, when we took a look, and I'm sure some of you folks can speak more specifically, we saw that it would make up about 20 to 40 percent of, of the cost to, to operate the vehicle over its lifetime, if I remember correctly from the, from the research. So it will, it will shift it if you don't have those fuel costs. I imagine it's going to show a lower life-to-date cost, which would shift the replacement cycle out, if I'm, if I'm thinking of that conceptually correct. Um, because again, it's, it's showing that you haven't spent uh, as much money on it as you actually have. It'd be the same impact as if you underestimate your mechanic rate. It, it's showing you're getting essentially a better deal. So your, your costs would be understated. But it's not a required field. I, I, w we understand that there are some folks who have some issues with the reliability of, of the fuel data. So it, it, that was actually a field that was initially required, and then we made that an optional field. One of the things I know about fuel, if you include fuel in analysis like this, it's another indicator of usage. The usage data is suspect when you use fuel. Well, Jeff, thank you very much. Thank you. I have one. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org.